This is my Bible. It is the Word of God, and it is the will of God for my life. I am who the Word says I am. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm where the Word says I am, seated right now in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in the place of authority, dominion, and power. And I have what the Word says I have. All the blessings of Abraham are mine. Today my mind is alert. My spirit is receptive as I'm taught the Word of God. My life has changed for the better, and I'll never be the same again. Well, Pastor, you left out, we can do what the Word says we can do. Well, wait a minute. you got to learn how to sit with Christ in the heavenly realms before you can do what the Word says you can do. we got people here this morning, you've been trying to walk, but you ain't set. We got people here this morning, you tried to run, but you haven't learned how to sit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, the Satan comes against us in these areas. And, and as long as we think we're just here on planet Earth, you know, just trying to make do like everybody else, well, he can just kick us from pillar to post. But when you meditate on the fact that he has raised us up and seated us with him at his right hand in Christ Jesus, in the place that is above all rule and authority, power and dominion, hallelujah, hallelujah. Then you're looking down on your circumstance and you're looking down on the works of the devil and you realize that you are in the victor seat and the enemy of your soul is defeated before you ever wake up in the morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Shout, I got the victory. Shout it like thunder, I've got the victory. Hallelujah. 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 You may be seated. If you have a Bible, we're going to start in Luke 4, and the message this morning is a little different, but uh, it'll take your thinking in a brand new direction. And the title this morning is, It's Time to Advance. I, lo I loved Austin's offering. I thought it was just great, really. It's just really dialed into where we're headed in the message. You know, a lot of times what happens is, and, uh, and I've seen it, I, I guess, thousands of times since we started this church in 1984, people come to us and they're completely broke. I mean, forget about being worth nothing. They're worth negative something. And they're desperate. Say desperate. And in their desperation, they begin tithing. In their desperation, they'll give a faith offering, a seed above and beyond the tithe as led by the Holy Spirit. And God blesses them, and they get a job, and God blesses them, and they get out of debt, and God blesses them, and they get a car under warranty, and God blesses them, and they buy a house. And what happens is somehow they lose their desperation, and they stay at the same level. I declare to you this morning, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is time to advance. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It is time to pick up the sling and the stones, and it's time to go to battle one more time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Luke 4, 18 and 19, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Let me ask you a question. When does a boy become a man? Well, we know the answer is actually when he begins to assume, to take, to embrace personal responsibility. But just speaking chronologically, when does a boy become a man? Well, let's just say about 20. And when did Jesus become the Son of God? Well, he was always the Son of God. When he was in Mary's womb, he was the Son of God. He never became the Son of God. So why didn't he heal anyone at age 20? Why didn't he heal anyone at age 21? Age 22, age 23, age 24, age 25, age 26, age 27, age 28. Why didn't he heal anyone at age 29? Look at Luke 3, verse 21, Luke 3, 21. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove and a voice came from heaven. You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Now Jesus himself was almost about 30 years old and 
when he began his ministry. So even though Jesus was always the Son of God, nothing supernatural happened through him until he was baptized with the Holy Spirit. Nothing supernatural happened through him until he was anointed by the Holy Spirit. Nothing supernatural happened through him until he was empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now look at Acts 10, 38. Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. I looked that up last evening. Actually, the, it's not just the translation that is important, but the verb tense. In the Greek, what it literally says is healing all who were being oppressed by the devil. Being is a present participle. Who were being oppressed by the devil. Now let's go to our passage this morning in Mark, in, excuse me, Matthew 11. Matthew 11, beginning in verse 1. After Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. When John heard in prison what Christ was doing, say it out loud, when John heard, John heard in, prison in prison what Christ was doing, Christ was doing. he sent his disciples to him, are you the one who was to come or should we expect someone else? And I have to take about two minutes and give a brief explanation here. To the best of my knowledge, there are two places in the Word of God where God superseded the free will of man. And in both of those cases, it was because God had something that had to be accomplished historically. Generally speaking, God will not violate the free will of man. However, the Bible does say in the Psalms that the hand of the king is, the heart of the king is in the hand of God like a water course. And he directs it whichever way he wants. That's why you can get a raise at work even if they don't like you. I mean, they might give you a raise and then later say, I don't even know why I gave you that raise. They might give you a promotion at work and say later, I don't even know why we gave you that promotion. And so God can on occasion override free will, but he doesn't do that as a matter of normal policy. I can think of one occasion where the Bible says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And the reason was, of course, because God wanted to do a mighty miracle bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt. But here is another one, and we know this because John was baptized in the Holy Spirit in his mother's womb. Think about it. Think about it. What Jesus had to wait until age 30 to receive, John got in his mother's womb. But his ministry had been completed. He has done his job. He had been the forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ. He had preached repentance. He had baptized people under repentance in the Jordan. He had baptized the Lord Jesus in the Jordan. His mission was accomplished. He was in prison awaiting his death. And God let go of him. God let go of his will. And having come to his own senses, he wondered, is this Jesus the one? When John heard in prison what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to him and asked him, are you the one who was to come or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. And the message this morning is really related to Evidence, signs and wonders. What does our faith produce? Verse 5, the blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No. Those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. 
And I tell you the truth, among those born of women, there is not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Why? Because he was the forerunner of the Lord. Yet, he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Well, how can he say that? How can he say there's never been anyone greater than John, yet he who is least in the kingdom is greater than, than John? Well, because he spent his childhood and his ministry under that hand of God to make sure that he fulfilled his purpose as the forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ. But you and I have never had that kind of uh, hand upon us. And yet here we are this morning as believers. You and I were not baptized in the Holy Spirit in our mother's wombs. And yet here we are this morning, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and forceful men lay a hold of it. And frankly, this is the problem not just with the culture, but this is the problem with much of the church in America today, the feminization and the wussification and the sissification of the culture and the church. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and forceful men lay a hold of it. <clears throat> See, I've seen thousands do this. When they come, when I meet them, they're broke. They have nothing. They, they're driving a tote-the-note car. They're living in an apartment. They're on welfare. Or maybe they're living on the handouts of relatives or they're living on some relative, relative sofa. They're, they're, just, they're just busted. And in their desperation, they'll, they'll latch on to the Word of God. In their desperation, they'll do things that their relatives will call, would call crazy because they're desperate. And to get out of their desperation, they do these forceful things. I mean, they might pray, they might fast. They give their lives to Christ. They begin tithing even. And you know, it's an amazing thing how easy to tithe it is when you ain't got nothing. Hallelujah. Amen. I say, go ahead and say, hallelujah. hallelujah. But what happens is, with the blessing of the Lord, sometimes people lose their fire. They get fat spiritually. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. He who has ears, let him hear. To what can I compare this generation? They are like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling out to others. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they said he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And then he, he makes this statement just <clears throat> almost as an aside, but how much power there is in this one sentence. But wisdom is proved right by her actions. And there are people here this morning, and, and your relatives thought you were crazy right up until they saw it working. Now, Jesus constantly said things like this, John 5, 19. John 5, 19, I tell you the truth, the Son of Man can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his Father doing because whatever the Father does, the Son does also. He was constantly, he wasn't denigrating himself. He was not uh, disparaging himself, but he was constantly confessing that the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. He was constantly confessing anointing, but you know what else he was constantly confessing? His utter and complete and total dependence upon the Father. Look at John uh, chapter 5, verse 30. By myself I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. And so he was constantly saying things like this. The Son of Man can do nothing by himself. <clears throat> By myself, I can do nothing. So on this challenge offering Sunday, I want to ask a few questions. Why are Christians behind Muslims in households making over $100,000? I mean, really, we ought to be ashamed of ourselves. 87% of Muslim immigrants are on welfare. 
and the political leadership of our country, both parties, both parties, both parties are stark raving lunatics to let any group in that ends up 87% on welfare. And yet, somehow over time, they pull ahead of Christians. I mean, think about, think about what a sorry lot Christians are in the United States of America that a group of people come in and they're 80 87% on welfare, but over time, they still pull ahead of Christians. Why are Christians behind Muslims in household making over $100,000? 17% for Christians, 20% for Muslims. Why aren't Christians forcefully advancing? Why are Christians behind atheists in households making over $100,000? I mean, what a sorry lot we have to be. I'm not talking about me. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about those people in the United States of America who say they are Christians. What a sorry, sorry lot that they can't even beat atheists. 17% for Christians and 30% for atheists. Why aren't Christians forcefully advancing? Why are Christians behind Hindus and households making over $100,000? 17% for Christians, 36% for Hindus. Why aren't Christians forcefully advancing? Why are Christians behind Jews and households making over $100,000? 17% for Christians, 44% for Christians. Why aren't Christians forcefully advancing? And of course, people say, well, you know, those are the Jews. They're blessed by God. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait, I, I just uh, quoted uh, Galatians 3, 13, 14 to my sister. You go to verse 29, and we find out that the reason Christ came was so that we as Gentiles could become inheritors of the promises of, that were given to Abraham. And the reason is, if you stop and think about, and where am I going in this message, that even though Jesus never became the Son of God, even though Jesus was the Son of God, forget about from birth, He was the Son of God in Mary's womb. And yet, during none of those 29 years did He perform one miracle or healing. He had to be baptized in the Holy Spirit of God. He had to have the Holy Spirit of God to come upon Him before anybody got healed. He was constantly confessing, I can do nothing of my own. I can only do what I see my father do. See, that's the Son of God. The Son of God confessed his utter dependence upon the leading of the Spirit, the baptism of the, Ho the Holy Spirit, the coming of the Holy Spirit. So, why is it that Christians are not forcefully advancing well because we don't do what Jesus did. We don't follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. I mean, think about it. He was the Son of God, but He was dependent upon following the leading of the Holy Spirit. Who the heck do we think we are that we think we're going to forcefully advance and, and we're going to achieve and, and we're going to overcome in life ignoring the God that is in the earth today. Over and over and over. Jesus said, I'm leaving, but I'm sending another. I'm leaving, but I'm sending another. And the one he said is the one that led him. Matthew eleven twelve. 12. <clears throat> From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and forceful men lay a hold of it. But the church hasn't been forcefully advancing, has it? Why? Because the church has not been following the leading of the Holy Spirit. I thought about calling this message Confessions of a One-Talent Man. I mean, think of it. I have no talents. I was a B-plus student. I was raised by narcissistic, emotionally closed-off, dysfunctional people. So how was I able to do all of this? 
What is my one talent? I was willing. I said I was willing. He told me to give that $1,400 above and beyond the tithe in 1977. Well, right there's a problem because, you know, if you're not tithing, well, you ain't willing. Yeah, but I, I, got, I got Hindus and Muslim uh, uh, neighbors up and down the road, and, uh, and they make plenty of money and they don't tithe. Well, they don't claim Christ, so they're not being held to the standard of those who claim Christ. You know, I even have employees here, and they do this and that. But there's one that's got the name Lingerfeld, and he can't get away with that. He's held to a higher standard. Why? Well, because of that name. And so you might have Hindu or Muslim or Buddhist or whatever neighbors, and they might, they might drive Bentleys, and they're not tithing. Well, God is not holding them to the standard he's holding you to because they're not his children. He told me to give that $1,400 above and beyond the tithe in 1977. About seven weeks pay for both of us, and we gave it. I was willing. And he told us to take a six-month-old baby to Africa when we were 26 years old, and we did it. We were willing. And he told us to pioneer Faith Christian Center with the $20,000 we had made on the sale of our first house after the tithe, and we did it. We were willing. He told us to pioneer St. Paul's Preparatory Academy in 1988 when the church wasn't even making it. And we did it. We were willing. He told us to put the roof on Bud Sickler's church, $600,000, about $2.1 million in 2015 dollars. And we did it. We were willing. Just a few Sundays ago, I sat over there and the Lord told me how much to give Jonathan Shuttlesworth, and I did it. I was willing. The same day, instant obedience. <clears throat> so John's in prison. His day is done. God turns loose of his will, and he's wondering, as men will, did I waste my life? Is this the one? And he hears about the healings and people being raised from the dead. What is, he, what is it that got his attention? Results. I said results. And he sends word, are you the one or are we to expect another? See, what got John's attention was the results. Evidence. And what happens to us is we come up out of the gutter, we come up out of a, a net worth of zero or a minus, and we hear about the gospel, we give our lives to Christ, maybe we wander into a faith church like this, and we, be, we begin to wonder, could it be, could it be, could it be? And we begin, because we're desperate, we begin to take action on the Word of God. And sure enough, God blesses, we get what? We get results. But there's something happens to us when we get a couple of cars under warranty and we get a house and we get comfortable and we we're able to go on vacations and we're able to do a cruise. Look what God did with two willing people and four hundred dollars. Look what God did. No talent, can't sing, can't play an instrument. When I dance before the Lord, it is a pitiful sight. <laughs> oh, but I would trade it all if I had it for a willing heart. I said I would trade it all if I had it for a willing heart.
Isaiah 119 says, if you are willing and obedient, you will eat from the best of the land. Kenneth Hagin used to say, if it's the will of God that you eat from the best of the land, it must be the will of God that you dress in the best of the land. If it's the will of God that you eat the best of the land, it must be the will of God that you drive the best of the land. If it's the will of God that you eat the best of the land, it must be the will of God that you live in the best of the land. If it's the will of God that you eat the best of the land, it must be the will of God that you vacation in the best of the land. What am I talking about this morning? I'm talking about how following the leading of the Holy Spirit produces results. Amen. Yeah, but you know, uh, we just went on a cruise. Now, we had to drive down to Galveston, and, uh, and, we, and we, we, we took one of those cruises where they have the wet t-shirt contest. You know, we're blessed. You're living in the results of what man produced. I'm here to tell you this morning to finance what God wants to do at these end times. We, we've got to leave the realm of what man can produce and we've got to begin to enter into the realm of what only God can produce. I'm here to give glory to God this morning. Every time I drive onto this property, I am amazed at what God can do through one willing person. I am amazed at what God has done. I am shocked at what God has done. It's not me. I know it's not me. When I drive home and those gates open, I sometimes say to whoever's in the car, gee, I wonder who lives here. Because it couldn't be me. Couldn't be that boy from Highland Park. Come on. Oh! This world has yet to see what God can do through a man who is 100% willing. I said this world has yet to see what God can do through a man or a woman that is 100% willing. And you know what's holding you back is fear. I said it's fear that's holding you back, that God's going to rob you, that God's going to steal from you, that God's going to lead you into the ditch. Come on. We left home and all we had was $400 Sue's grandpa gave us. Look what the Lord has done. 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 Ain't gone broke yet. <laughs> Hallelujah. I said I ain't gone broke yet. And I'm not fixing to go broke. Hallelujah. Some of you men. You made, your God, you made your God your wife. And as long as she has more than her mommy and daddy, she's satisfied. But I'm telling you, there's a land beyond. I'm telling you, there's a place in God beyond where you are. If you are willing and obedient, You'll eat the best of the land, not just willing, obedient, not just obedient, willing. What was it that drew John's attention once he came back to operating in his own free will? Verse 5, the blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. You see, following the Holy Spirit produces results, and that's what makes the devil's crowd mad. That's what makes the devil's crowd mad. Well, who does he think he is to have all that land? Doesn't even need it. I'm the blessed of the Lord. Why does he need all those cars? Well, one might run out of gas. Come on. <laughs> Come on. 
God does not mind his people being wealthy. God minds his people being covetous. But let me tell you what, if we could have done it in human effort and human strength and human wisdom and human understanding, we would have already gotten there. You see, following the Holy Spirit produces results. How, how does Sue and I have all these results? By doing what God said do for 39 years. Are we perfect at it? No. And that's, that's where I'm at right now. Oh, my God, I don't want to miss him one more time. I don't want to miss him not one more time. I don't want to miss him not one more time. I don't want to miss him not one more time. And why do so many stay stuck where they are? Because they refuse to hear God and or they refuse to do what God has said. See, Psalm 23 says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The, see, it, it, maybe that's the problem. Maybe your wife's your shepherd. Man, you see how they like that? <laughs> if you can't say amen, you're afraid of your woman. Well, why can you, you know, if you talk like that, I might leave. Well, you ain't, you ain't contributing anyway. <laughs> Just soaking up air conditioning. Taking up parking. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Say it out loud, the Lord is my shepherd. Is my shepherd. I shall not want. Shall not the Lord is my shepherd. I shall, not lack. I shall not lack. Say it like you believe it. The Lord is my shepherd. Is my shepherd. I, shall I shall not lack. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. See, he's not ever led anybody in the ditch yet. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth in the leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Say, no fear. No fear. I said, no fear. no fear. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thy rod, that's to lead, to guide. It's got the hook on the end. The staff, that's to pop you on the hind quarter when you get out of line. Thank God, thank God, thank God for his discipline because I don't want to get off course. And I love it. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. They might hate my guts, but when they drive up and down the highway, they got to think about me. <laughs> Hallelujah. They might hate the word of God, but when they drive up and down the highway, they got to think about me. Hallelujah. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemy. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, that's the life of victory God wants you to experience. I obeyed God, and I didn't go backward, backwards, I went forwards. I listened to God, and I didn't go backwards, I went forwards. I did what God said, and I didn't go backwards, I went forwards. You know, we owe about 6.7 million, I think, on, on all of this now. And we've given away over $10 million since we began. Gave it away. Somebody might say, that's bad business. No, no, no. Because if we hadn't given away the $10 million, we wouldn't have anything to have $6.7 million debt on. We'd still be up there on that three and a quarter acres. Yeah, but pastor, you know, I'm comfortable. That's your problem. Pastor, I got no debt. Well, of course not. You're driving a 1954 Ford pickup and you're living in a double wide. <laughs> Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Say it out loud, my cup runneth over. Oh my God, in verse 6, surely goodness. Oh, 
surely goodness and mercy. You know, can you see him following me? Big, bad angels, one of them's named Shirley. Not S-H-I-R-L-E-Y, but S-U-R-E-L-Y, Shirley, and goodness. And they're following me all the days of my life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Goodness and mercy. I said goodness and mercy. I said goodness and mercy are following me. And I, then, then I get the, I have the joy, I have the privilege, I have the honor of starting with nothing, starting with nothing, and living willing before the Lord, and being led by the Holy Spirit of God, and doing what God said, and not going backwards, going forwards, and being made rich in earthly goods, and doing what God said, and being followed by goodness and mercy, all the days of my life. I have that joy, that privilege, but that is just the beginning because when my day is done kicking the devil's backside on planet Earth, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I don't want to go in. I don't want to go in like a refugee. Well, I'm sure glad you raptured us because I was really getting the, you know what, kicked out of my backside by the devil. No, 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 no. Thanks be unto God who always leads us in triumphal procession through Christ and spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of Him. Hallelujah. We saw this week for the first time Christians martyred on the soil of the United States and no one in leadership cares. You know what you call that? Being the tail. And how did we get to be the tail? By underperforming the wicked. God gave you a Bible and God gave you the Holy Spirit so he's holding us to a higher standard than those pagans. If we want to go to the next level, we've got to learn how to do what it says in the Word of God and then to develop that willing heart and to be led by the Holy Spirit of God. Can you say amen this morning? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't want anybody to go out here and lie to me. I give him all the credit, all the glory, all the honor. One-tenth of what he has done was beyond my ability. God did it. God did it. God did it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Confessions of a one-talent man. I was willing. That's all I got. When are you going to play the piano, Pastor? You, you don't want that. <laughs> when are you going to sing a solo, Pastor? You don't want that. This is all I got. I'm willing. I pray every day. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll say what you want me to say. I'll give what you want me to give. Because I've proven it. You cannot. Go backwards, following the leading of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I hope you enjoyed the message this morning. <laughs>